paragraph C. Again, the premise is that the Antichrist is raised up by the sovereignty of God. It's God's sovereign plan and power. And that's part of the message of Daniel chapter 7, verse 7 and 8 is the first appearance of the Antichrist to Daniel. Verse 9 is the throne. And that's the message in the sequence of these verses uh, or the scenes in this vision. Verse 20, Matthew 28, the premise, all authority is mine. Jesus said, in the heavenly realm, all the authority in the spirit realm, all the authority in hell, all the authority on the earth, all authority is mine. I will stop him the day I choose. Matter of fact, he says, 42 months, 1,260 days. I'll tell you the day. The name adds 1,290. I'll tell you the day of his demise. That's how much power I have over him. Thousands of years ahead of time, I can tell you the day of his demise. Now, nobody can predict the fall of an empire and the day that the most powerful leader of the empire is killed. Jesus said, I'll give it to you thousands of years ahead of time. Now, we don't know the day, but the day has already been determined by the authority of the Father. Paul affirmed this idea in Romans 13, verse 1. He says, no authority. There is no authority except that God allows it. He's talking about governmental authority on the earth. There is no evil leader that somehow got by God's notice and got into power. He goes, there is no such authority. He was talking now in the book of Romans with uh, evil leaders. I mean, Nero was on the scene in the Roman Empire. Nero killed Paul. And Paul's writing to Rome. And he says, Nero did not escape God's notice. He was put in place by God, though the devil's fully responsible. And the evil choices of sinful man that engaged in it, they're guilty too. These authorities are, that exist are appointed by God. They are avengers to execute the wrath of God on the people who practice evil. You say, how can the Antichrist be a vessel of the wrath of God? Well, the people that actually supported the Antichrist come under judgment by the very reign of terror of the Antichrist. Many of them come under destruction even by this man's own leadership. His own ways and policies lead to the abomin uh, abomination of desolations, the desolation of nations. Paragraph D, again, this idea of the sovereignty of God. God raised up Pharaoh. Now, maybe you've seen a, a movie about Exodus and Moses and Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's kind of, you know, a little bit domesticated, a little bit vanilla, a little bit Hollywood. Pharaoh was a really mean guy. He was a very evil, oppressive man. He didn't have some of the charm, some of the Hollywood movies put a little touch on it. God said, I raised him up. I mean, what an offensive thing to say in the hour when they, the Jews were in slavery for 400 years. You raised up Pharaoh? Yes, I raised up the Pharaoh that resisted me. The Assyrian leader, Sennacherib, who brought destruction to the 10 tribes of Israel in 721 B.C. God said, I raised him up. Ouch. Nebuchadnezzar, very evil, demonized man, and brought the nation of Judah and the, relation, uh, the, the tribe of Judah and the nation, uh, the city of uh, Jerusalem destruction. I raised that man up. I mean, this is intense. He raised up the Persian kings, he said. Paragraph E. Daniel saw the saints were given into the hands of the Antichrist by God. It's not, it's not the devil. The devil didn't have authority over God. God says, no, no, I'm going to give the Antichrist room to persecute them physically. And in that context, they will triumph over him spiritually. And I'll purify the church and the nations and bring in the great harvest in the context of that. Bring the nation of Israel to salvation. It says in, later on in the vision of Daniel 7, he'll persecute, speaking of the Antichrist, verse 25, he'll persecute the saints. The saints will be given into his hand. Again, physically given into his hand. This means persecution and martyrdom. 
God will intervene in some cases. There'll be miracles of deliverance, even in persecution, but there will be many that will lose their life. But God will triumph. The grace of God will be magnified in it. Love will abound in the whole context. Revelation 13, John the Apostle really emphasizes this. The Antichrist will be given or granted authority. Look at this, Revelation 13. The Antichrist is given authority, and the idea is clearly by God. Now, Satan does give his authority to the Antichrist, but Satan doesn't have authority over Jesus. He can't, he doesn't have authority over the church. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. The final authority is his. Verse 7, it was granted to him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints. It was granted to overcome the saints physically for a short season. Again, that love would abound, that purity would go forth. The great harvest would happen. Authority was given him. Look at the five times here in this passage, the term given or granted or a equivalent to it is mentioned. It's mentioned very many times in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation I have here at the end of paragraph E. Okay, so now we have the Antichrist. Let's go to the top of page 2. We have the Antichrist in verse 7 and 8, but verse 9 we have the sovereignty of God, the throne of God, verse 9 and 10. The way to overcome fear of the Antichrist is to grow in understanding of the sovereignty and the majestic beauty of God on his throne. When we see the throne, we have courage and confidence before the threats. When we don't see the throne and all we see is the threats, then we draw back in fear and we're intimidated. Paragraph B, no aspect of the grace of God more transforms the heart. No aspect more satisfies the heart than when God reveals God to the human heart. When God the Spirit reveals the Father and the Son, our heart is transformed, satisfied, I mean, exhilarated and fascinated by who God is. Beloved, I don't want to just serve the Lord. I want to be obsessed with Him. I want Jesus to be my magnificent obsession. I don't want to serve and have an honorable ministry and do pretty good. No, that's not what's all. I want to be obsessed with this man. The majesty and the beauty of this man. All of heaven is obsessed with this man. I want to experience the power and the pleasure of being obsessed with him and his father. That's what's happening here in Revelation, I mean, in Roman, uh, Daniel 7. Daniel is he's captured by what he sees. And there's a message in this. The message is when we see the throne, when we see the beauty, when we see the majesty of the Lord, it equips us to overcome temptation. It equips us to endure persecution. Here at the end of paragraph B, to engage in partnership. When I see who he is, I don't want to draw back and avoid it. I want to engage I want to be fully engaged in prayer. I'm going to be fully engaged in the works of the kingdom, proclaiming fearlessly the truth of who he is. And if you lose your head, you lose your head. And one thousandth of a second later, you're in the presence of the glory of God. Amen. Not even a full second. I mean, they might kill you. I just, if, if, if I end up in that situation, I just want them to do it fast. <laughs> I mean, it is intensely glorious what happens. Like, I love to tell folks, the goal of the, in the end times isn't to avoid death. That's not the goal. The goal is to be faithful. Everyone's going to die physically, except for the, the very moment, at the very end of the rapture. The goal is not to avoid death. The goal is to avoid being unfaithful. That's what we want to avoid. I want to be faithful. You die one second later... You died tonight. A second later, you're in the glory of God. You're, Whoa, this is amazing. <laughs> Paragraph C. We don't have to be fearful of death. We're not afraid of the Antichrist. We're not afraid he's going to... The church should not be afraid he's going to kill them. 
So what if he kills them? I mean, the loss, relational loss of people not seeing their loved ones, that's real, but it's like in the big picture of the sovereignty of God, the eternity of God. It is the glory of the saints to give their life for love. Verse 9, now he sees, we see the throne of God. He says, I watched, because he was watching the Antichrist, the terrible, dreadful beast. Then immediately, the next verse, I'm watching. Thrones were put in place around the heavenly courtroom. So it's, the implication is, the thrones are not there permanently. There's that around the throne of God, there's times when the thrones are set up. That's the, that's the implication to this. I don't know a lot about how it works up there. But he's watching, and the throne scene, the thrones are now established for the court to go in session next. Then the Ancient of Days is seated. He's seeing the heavenly courtroom. There seemingly are various dimensions of that heavenly court. And so the thrones are set up and the Father is seated. It's like there's this movement in action. We go, wow, how's that work? I don't know. But it's the implication, there are, again, various dimensions and aspects of the heavenly court. His garments, white as snow. His hair, pure wool. That's white as snow as well, the same idea. His throne, fiery. Verse 10. I mean, his throne is a flame of fire. The wheels related to the throne. You say the wheels? Yes, the wheels. They're burning fire too. What is that like? I don't know, but I can't wait to see this. I think. I might get there and go, oh. <laughs> maybe far more intense than we imagine. I think it is. Because all that are around the throne, the seraphim, they, they cover their eyes when they get near this scene. Verse 10, a fiery stream, or the New American Standard says a river. A river of fire comes out from before the throne. A thousand thousands of angels are ministering. 10,000 times 10,000 angelic beings. And when that happens, the thrones are put up, the ancient of days, again, there's a, a dimension of movement. This is a, an aspect of the larger royal palace and courtroom of, of God. Now the court is seated on their thrones. They're ushered in and books are open. I mean, what a glorious, full, majestic scene. Well, the father in Daniel 7 three times is called the Ancient of Days. That's his title. It depicts his eternal nature. But, but, but more than that, his plans related to the end times, because that's what Daniel 7 is about, mostly, they are rooted in an eternal perspective. It's not only that God is eternal, his plans only make sense with an eternal perspective. That's the idea. You can't see. I mean, you can't understand the intensity of the evil. You can't understand the intensity of the suffering without seeing the eternal picture. If all we see is how it feels and looks right now, we'll never be equipped. We, we spend time and energy anchoring our mindset into the realm of eternity. 